Hello everyone, Physicus here. Welcome to another tutorial. In this one we will cover the dynamic campaign in BMS, how it works, how you can select different aircraft, and a few tips of what you should and shouldn't do. I will also demonstrate a couple different theaters other than the Korean theater of operations. This tutorial is based on my knowledge about the dynamic campaign, my understanding of it. There may be some mistakes and inaccuracies in this tutorial, but I believe that if you understand it, you'll be able to do well in the dynamic campaign. Let's get into it. The dynamic campaign is arguably one of the most well-known features of Falcon BMS. It is a combined arms engagement in which factions clash. These factions can contain several participants depending on the particular scenario. It simulates an all-out war, and every little contribution or failure impacts the overall events both in the near and long term. For example, if your flight is able to neutralize SAM sites in an area, a corridor can be opened for other strike packages to be more successful with their missions. If you fail that task, other packages will struggle with performing their own missions. They might take losses, losses which will later impact the availability of aircraft for missions. This doesn't mean that you should go on suicide missions. If you have a task that you feel you can't accomplish because of the changing nature of the battlefield, like if you're weighed down with bombs, but you're about to run into a wall of enemy aircraft, there is no shame in aborting the mission and bringing the aircraft back to base instead of taking on the unreasonable odds and getting every aircraft in your flight shot down. Also, logistics matter. Power plants, factories, chemical plants and refineries all have an impact on the ongoing war. For example, take out enemy factories and chemical plants and it will severely impact the enemy's ability to recuperate after losses and usage of weapons. Keep in mind they will be trying to do the same to you. Keeping with logistics, if you don't use up every munition on your mission, bring them back to base if they don't interfere with flight safety. They will be useful later and there isn't an unlimited supply of them. The same thing goes for the external fuel tanks. Only jettison them if you have a situation or emergency that requires it. Jettison them too often and you might find yourself with no access to them until their supply is replenished. You can imagine how not having them, especially in the F-16, can impact which missions you can and can't do. I was sent this diagram, which I think is a great demonstration of how the logistics of the campaign works. Hit power plants and you will affect the output of the factories, chemical plants and refineries. Hit these, and like I mentioned before, you'll be severely impacting the enemy's ability to replace losses, both on the air and on the ground, as well as restricting what weapons and in which quantities they have available to them. Also, if you're out on a mission, when there are no enemy aircraft in the area and you are in range of an enemy transport fly nearby, if you can afford to take a shot at it, do it, as it's most likely delivering supplies to wherever it's going. Also, one of the most important mission types is offensive counter-air, or OCA strikes. Take out the runway of an enemy airbase and it will be unable to launch aircraft from there until an engineering unit arrives and repairs the damage. This will obviously affect the enemy's ability to strike at your faction, as well as weaken their own defenses. Finally, attack enemy ground combat units, both at the point of contact with your own forces, in close air support or CAS missions, as well as prior to them arriving at the front line in air interdiction or AI missions. This will affect the damage they can do to friendly ground units, or if enough damage is done to them before they arrive at the front line, they might turn around and route not even dealing any damage to friendly forces. On the campaign interface, select a different scenario that you want to play on from the list on the left. Each has different circumstances, units, objectives, belligerents and neutrals. Then on the map, click on the airbases to select a squadron that's based there. For example, if I want to fly F-16's Block 50 out of Gunsan Air Base, I will have to click on it. Then, on the list between the scenarios and the map, I will have to select a squadron that's equipped with them. Once you have the desired squadron selected, click on Commit. When you load into a campaign, you'll get the Priorities interface. This can be accessed and modified at any point during the campaign by clicking on this button. The first tab in the Priorities interface is the Target Types. You can adjust any of these sliders. These will determine which of these friendly forces will prioritize. The second tab is the mission type. This determines how many of each of these mission types will be created or fragged, not only for the squadron you're flying with, but for every squadron present in the campaign. 
The third tab is the packs. Here you can determine which areas of the theater of operations should be prioritized for mission creation. I recommend changing these from the default in the initial stages of the campaign. Adjust the zones to prioritize areas closer to the front line and maybe the areas immediately behind them. I say this because by default, some of the areas with high priority are deep into enemy territory and it's better to go to these zones later on in the campaign when the first line of enemy air defenses have been significantly degraded. Revisit any of these tabs and adjust them if you feel like there are mission types and areas that should be prioritized at a certain point on the ongoing war. If this is your first time playing the campaign, it will look a bit like this, with only the fly path for your mission as well as the home plate and alternate fields being the only markings on the map. I suggest that you change this to have more information on the screen. This is going to seem like a lot, but it will end up giving you a better perspective about the ongoing operations and hopefully help you prepare for your missions better. Right click anywhere on the map, go to installations, then activate every installation except for political, nav beacon and other. I set up the map this way because the vast majority of missions are flown against and in protection of the installations I mentioned that should be activated. Right click on the map again, go to air units and with the exception of squadrons, activate every single aircraft type. This will help you have a better idea of every aircraft detected in the airspace, even unidentified types. Now for ground units. Again, right click on the map, go to ground units, then switch from divisions to battalions. After that, activate combat, air defense and support. This will show you the position of all ground forces, both friendly ones and the detected enemy ones. This is especially useful if you need to check the composition and strength of a particular unit, for example, a SAM battery. In order to do this, right click on the unit, go to status, and here you can see the composition and strength of this unit. The last type that I activate is naval units. This is not as important to activate because their impact on the campaigns is limited compared to other assets, but some of the task forces carry potent air defenses, so it's better to know where they are. Right click on the map, go to naval units, then activate combat and supply. The mission schedule screen is the default screen you'll be on when you load into the campaign. These are the most relevant items here. On the top left, you will find the frag order for the squadron you're a part of. It lists the mission scheduled for the unit, the flight's priority, represented by a letter, the flight's takeoff time, its task, the package number, and the status of the flight. Beneath that, the flight's call sign and the aircraft type will be displayed, as well as the number of aircraft on that flight. Click on one of the aircraft to assign yourself to that position for the flight. Underneath, you will see the overall package task, the main target of the package, and the flight's time on target. Along the bottom, there are several buttons. The first one is the order of battle. When on this screen, click on each faction to see what types of assets and units they have available to them, their status, and where they are on the map. Keep in mind that for enemy factions, specifically for ground units, you will only be able to see their location if they are currently being detected on the map. To the right of that, you have the air tasking order. Initially, it will only show information for the flights that are part of the package that you have selected. If you click on show entire air tasking order, all currently scheduled flights for your faction will be displayed, sorted by their test type. If you click on the box to the right of the package information, the flight plan for the flights which are part of that package will be displayed on the map in black. This is useful, for example, to mark the track a tanker will be on with steer point lines. Next, we have the briefing section. All right, listen up. This is an essential tool to visit prior to every mission, as it contains crucial information like Overall package information, situation, pilot roster, package elements, threat analysis, steer point information, the comm ladder, IFF information, link 16 information, currently loaded ordnance, weather conditions at departure time, over the target, and for recovery, support assets, rules of engagement, and emergency procedures. After that, we have the loadout section, where you can configure the ordnance that you want loaded on your aircraft. Next, there's the flight plan. 
Here you can check and if necessary change the values and actions at each steer point. You can also check and edit these values for other flights in your package, not just your own, by pressing this drop down menu and selecting the appropriate flight. Following there's the data cartridge. This is an indispensable menu to visit. Make sure that all your information is correctly configured and then saved prior to every mission. When you're all set up and ready to go, press the takeoff button. Here you can select at what time and in what state you load into your aircraft. Ramp loads you at your parking space with the aircraft shut off at 21 minutes from departure time. Taxi will have your aircraft set up for taxiing still at the parking space at 5 minutes from departure time. Runway will have your aircraft ready for takeoff lined up on the runway. On the top of the interface you can find the intel screen. Visit this section to get an idea of how the campaign is progressing, the current air and ground priorities, and compare strength levels, among other things. On the top left, you can see what the air defensive and offensive priorities are, as well as an estimated time at which offensive counter-air operations will begin. Under that, you can check the current posture the ground forces are on and what their current defensive priority is. When the ground units are on the offensive, you will be able to check what their objective is. After that, you can find the strength levels for each side's assets at the current date and time. By default, shown here, are the air defenses, ground power, supply, and air power. Click on one of the drop-down menus to select a different type of asset, for example, naval power. These will vary as the campaign progresses. The sides take losses, replacements are put back into the units, reinforcements arrive, and other belligerents enter the campaign. After that, we have the recent updates. These are important events that took place in the theater of operations. These can be air or ground engagements, units taking locations, etc. Under that, you have a map that shows with each side's color the area they currently control. On the bottom of the screen, click on the Sierra Hotel section to see how your air-to-air -air kill count on the current campaign measures up against other pilots of the squadron. To the right of that, on the Fighter Squadron section, you can check information about the squadron, such as the number of available aircraft and pilots, the morale and supply status, the losses suffered, number and rating of missions that were flown, as well as the number of kills the squadron have accumulated. If you click on the Pilot subsection, you can check the stats for individual pilots in the squadron. Next, there's the J-STARS replay. This is an overview of the overall ground forces movements up until the present point of the campaign. This is most useful after a considerable amount of time has passed. Finally, there are the force levels. These graphics allow you to gauge how the strength levels of each asset have evolved since the start of the campaign up until present time. On the BMS forum, there are several theaters of operations. You can find them under Theater Discussion. Some of these are official BMS theaters. Others are made and maintained by the community. These different theaters have dynamic campaigns of their own. Some of these scenarios are based on real life events, while others are fictional confrontations. Here are a few examples of these theaters. This is the Balkan Theater of Operations. As the name implies, it covers much of the Balkans region, as well as a lot of Italy. This is the Israel Theater of Operations. It covers a lot of the Middle East region, like Israel, Palestine, Jordan, some of Syria, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. This is the Middle East Theater of Operations. It covers Iraq, Kuwait, a lot of Saudi Arabia, and some of Iran, as well as Qatar, the UAE, and Bahrain. The BMS Dynamic Campaign can look very intimidating due to its complexity and scale. However, I would still recommend that you give it a try. Even if you're only proficient on a certain type of mission initially, fly that mission type when they are available and experience the campaign for yourself. Trying to keep to areas where the danger is lower when compared to other areas deeper into enemy territory. If you have the opportunity to experience the Dynamic Campaign with a multiplayer group, I think you'll enjoy it even more. And there we have it. That was a brief overview on the interface of the Dynamic Campaign. I hope this tutorial was helpful. Thank you for watching.
and I will see you on the next one.